So we'll let her, we'll let her, let her take off. Thank you. She's gonna take off like a jet. <laughs> Good. So I'll sit right in front of her here so she can look at my pretty face. <laughs> Thank you, Herman. Yeah. Uh, it is an honor that Herman asked me to come here today to share with you my journey on prayer. So the, the title of this uh, sharing is How God Taught Me to Pray in Different Seasons of My Life. I'd like to start with an opening prayer. Lord, open up my heart so your spirit can take over my mouth and let me speak only what you want me to say. Prepare all the hearts of those who will listen to your message through my testimony and sharing, and let them be without judgment, but have an openness to see what you're going to teach them today through me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Psalm 19, verse 14. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to share the poem that God gave me for today. Why pray? To pray is to communicate and openly say, it is to, a protection to help us from going astray. To pray is to declare and acknowledge God's power. It helps us win over sin and let the enemy cower. We praise the Lord each time we give him thanks. It shows we appreciate all the provisions he always sends. We lift our hearts, mind and soul when we spend time with him. Prayer brings us to our knees so we can repent of all our sins. When we ask for things that are aligned with God's will, we obey his commands and not rely on what we feel. When we pray, we shield ourselves from the enemy. It brings us to a place of peace, abundance, and victory. When we pour out our weaknesses and our need for him, he, cried, he hears our cries. He lets righteousness win over sin. When we intercede for others in prayer, we show that we care. When we don't get answers, press on and don't despair. When we ask and believe that we have already received it, we have grown our faith and allowed him to work in our spirits. When we forgive others before we come to the throne of grace, he grants us mercy and gives us more blessings so we can stay amazed. And that is uh, inspired from 1 John 5, 14 to 15. Now this is a confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. So I'd like to start my testimony. Uh, this is my prayer journey testimony. And just like to let you know that each part of my sharing will be interspersed with the Bible verses that replaces the lies in each circumstance. So my first season is called Invitation from Jesus Season. And that was since I was age two years old up to 11. I was marinated in neglect, verbal put downs, belittling, criticisms, minimizations, anger, outbursts, and beatings since age two from my own and extended family. When I say something, I was immediately asked to shut up. I can't remember being hugged or told that I am loved by anyone. I felt invisible and no one seemed to care about me. I felt alone and no one was there to love or comfort me. I felt like drowning and no one was rescuing me. 2 Corinthians 1.3 says, God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. And Psalm 34.18 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. On my walk to my first day of kindergarten class, I was about six years old this time, I heard a voice inside me say, I'm here. I will listen to you. I love and care for you so much. 
You can speak to me anytime because I'm always with you and I will never abandon you. And Deuteronomy 31, 8 says, Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. So from that day onwards, I spoke to him aloud. When I woke up, during my walks to and from school, and before I slept, the school was walking distance from where we lived, and I walked ahead of the babysitter so I can talk aloud to Jesus. I can't recall anyone telling me to talk to Jesus. I didn't know that the Holy Spirit was teaching me to connect with him daily. No one in my family knew the Holy Spirit or read the Bible. It was a book displayed in our living room, and no one can touch it because my mother said it was a sacred thing. John 14, 6, 26 says, but when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. When I learned to write at age seven, I wrote Jesus letters as an addition to my chats with him. I knew I could pour out my heart to him also in writing. There were so many confusing things happening around my family at this time. So writing to Jesus became my sanctuary. I needed to be assured that I belonged to Christ because I felt like an orphan. I had a family, yet they were not really present for me. Proverbs 3, 3 says, write them deep within your hearts. And Psalm 142 verses 2 to 3 says, I pour out my complaint before him. I declare my trouble before him. When I'm overwhelmed, you alone know the way I should turn. I then received Jesus in my first communion at age seven. First Corinthians eleven twenty six says, for every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. This season began my prayer journey and relationship with Jesus. I'll go to my next season, which is called the bitterness poison season. This is from age 12 to 19 years old. I added chapel and church visitations to my prayer life. I learned in school that a church was where Jesus lived. I wanted to show the Lord that I'd go out of my way to visit him. I also felt holy when I was surrounded by images of saints, Mary, and Jesus. No one really pointed me to the word of God. We had many churches where I lived, probably a hundred churches around my area. First Corinthians 12, 27 says, all of you together are Christ's body and each of you is a part of it. And Exodus 24 to six says, you must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. My life got confusing because no one was guiding me. Depression started to seethe into me because of the continued exposure to love, starvation, and neglect. I rebelled and wanted answers so badly. Why do I feel so worthless? And why don't I feel that I belong to anyone or to this family? Bitterness started to take root in my heart. I began to search for God in other religions like some Hindu religions. I searched for a new church who could make me feel like family. I was baptized in a river by a church denomination I can't even recall. I started to be fascinated by philosophy and human reasoning. I began to neglect my time with God and stopped writing him letters. I was dazzled by the world and the pursuit of knowledge became an obsession. I was held prisoner by the bitterness and pain I suffered. I didn't realize that I opened many doors for the enemy to capture me as his slave. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 12, 15 says, look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. And 2 Corinthians 10, four to five says, we use my, God's mighty weapons not worldly weapons to knock down the strongholds 
of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thought and teach them to obey Christ. The next season is called the hardened heart season, which is from age 20 to 27. It was at this season that I left home to free myself from the pain and neglect I experienced from, from it. I was full of idealism that I can create a better life for myself alone. I wasn't aware that there were many generational sins and strongholds that were passed on to me. Without guidance and a foundation anchored on love, I literally walked into a world that I knew nothing about. I chased romantic love and filled up the emptiness inside me by seeking attention and using my talents to alleviate myself of the pain. I got angry with God for not being there for me. I didn't realize that it was me who turned my back on Him. I began to wallow in various sins and it brought me much shame and guilt. I stopped any form of communication with God because I was ashamed of how I lived my life. Proverbs 4.23 says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. And Hebrews 3.8 says, Today, when you hear His voice, don't harden your hearts. The next season is called my epiphany season, which is from age 28 to 38 years old. As a result of my sinful life, I bore a child. I wanted to fix my life and give my son the life I never had. It was when I decided to get back to my relationship with God. This was my first encounter with the Holy Scriptures. I repented of all my sins and asked God to forgive me. I needed, to, I needed Him to help me raise a child who was the consequence of the sinful life I led. I don't want my son to go through what I went through. I felt God's presence again as I went back to writing Him and talking to Him daily. I was shocked to find that many verses in the Bible that I began to read, I already knew. I had been schooled by the Holy Spirit during that time I first connected with Jesus and even during the darkest moments of my sinful life that I first, uh, sorry, He never left me. He changed my negative thinking and taught me to count my blessings. I started to a thank you diary and it completely changed me. I wrote a list of blessings I receive each day this whole 10 years. Romans 8.26 says, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groaning that cannot be expressed in words. As my son turned seven, we added worship to our devotions. He played violin and while I sing and play guitar after breakfast, lunch, and before bedtime. I read a couple of verses and explained to my boy about the verse before we sang praise songs. We close our prayers by talking to Jesus out loud from our hearts. We did this for about five years, daily. Ephesians 5, 18, 19 says, Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. I also went to Mass daily. I married myself to a perfect husband, who is God. I went to communion daily so I can feel that He is with me daily. I also ask Him to be the perfect father for my son since His biological father wasn't there to raise Him. Isaiah 54, 5 says, For your Creator is your husband. Hosea 2, 16 says, When that day comes, says the Lord, you will call me my husband instead of master. And Psalm 68, 5 says, Father to the fatherless. God showered me with provisions and blessings during my solo parenting years. He also taught me how to paint, which became part of my healing. It was my dream to be a painter since I was two years old, and it took over three decades for it to be fulfilled. He taught me how to express myself in the visual arts. I became prolific and sold over 400 paintings. I acknowledge God for every achievement at the start of my painting career. This while was my epiphany, my illumined season. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 says, and God will generously provide all that you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. 
My next season is the last season, healing and commission season, which is from age 39 up to the present. I became proud of my art success and I was all over the place to prove I was great. I was a teacher, painter, photographer, stage manager, actress, and super mom to a violin virtuoso. I micromanaged my son's violin career and did exactly the same thing my parents did to me. I groomed him to perform so people can see that I was a great parent. He became another achievement project for me. He despised me for it as much as I despised my parents. History was repeating itself in the family. Then I began to fear that my son was going to leave me soon because he was turning 16 already. I became tired of the constant conflicts with my son who was rebelling too much. I forgot that he probably inherited all the strongholds from both my family and his father's lineage as well. God made me answer, God made me aware of these generational curses and I began to break the chains of these curses through prayers. Exodus 20, 45 says, You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or any image of anything in heavens or in earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affections for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children, in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. I began to fear that my son was going to leave me soon because he was turning 16 already. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. In my desperation, I started to search for a husband. He couldn't understand that his father was God and not a man whom he can touch and play with. I caved into his relentless request to see his dad and gave his father access even though I fear that his wayward lifestyle will be harmful to him. My son witnessed his sinful life and it got him more rebellious and confused. After a few years of seeing him, my son started to resent his father. Proverbs 16, 17 to 18. The path of the virtuous leads away from evil. Whoever follows that path is safe. Pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. My son's father died after a few years of connecting with him. It left pain in my son's heart because when his dad died, he felt so much hatred for him. His father's death made him very angry and withdrawn. He slipped farther away from me. It brought me back to memories of my pain from my past. My son doesn't look up to me anymore. I got back full circle to my lonely and loveless life. I thought my son would fulfill that. I gave him everything so that I won't have to, to experience that pain, and I was a failure. I became a warrior and controller even more. Didn't know that the enemy was stealing my relationships through anger, bitterness, and grief. I wrote more psalms and prayers of anguish. I wailed and cried out to God to help me. 1 Peter 5, 7 to 8, Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy. The devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I took matters into my hands and resorted to find a husband on the internet dating sites. I didn't realize that the enemy was using my son's grief to stir up old wounds in me. I kept on praying, but the way I prayed was more like bullying God to give me what I want so my pain will go away. I prayed, complaining to God why he doesn't change my circumstances. I want to escape loneliness and the political turmoil and poverty in my country, so I married my first Canadian husband. I moved to Canada thinking that my life will be better and be prosperous as a painter and photographer. I continued to pray, but I was swaying God to grant me my plan. I didn't grasp how dangerous it was to go against God's plan for me. I didn't even know what his plans for my life was because I was living in a city of regret and bitterness. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. 
I want to escape loneliness and the political turmoil and poverty, so I moved to Canada. This marriage failed because it wasn't founded on love. I deceived myself that I loved the man I married. He had his agenda to marry me and turn me into a sex slave. He didn't allow my son to come over to live with us in Canada. He wouldn't be able to abuse me if he, had, if he was with me. I was separated from my son for two years. We have never been separated since he was born. I thank God that he provided a way out for me from that abusive relationship. He even gave me a pro bono lawyer to give me the divorce. James 1, 2 to 3, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy, for you know that when your fate is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. After working in a factory for a year, I got my son to join me here. I cried out to God for forgiveness, for compromising my relationship with my son so I could escape my troubles. Psalm 107, 19, Lord, help. They cried in their trouble and he saved them from their distress. I couldn't find a decent job after my son came over. I applied to over 3,000 companies in my first year here in Canada. I couldn't get hired. I got rejected one after the other. I started getting angry again at God for what I can't have. My son didn't have trouble finding jobs and yet I couldn't. Why isn't God answering my prayers? Why can't he give me a job? What was wrong with God? James 4, 2 to 3 says, you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. The divorce made me depressed and ill. I couldn't sleep and was too weak to move, so I was on computers most of the day. I discovered Bible teachers online. I found Bible studies groups in Orangeville. I read the Bible for hours. In one of the Bible studies, I learned to pray deeply and learned to listen to God's voice. Scriptures began popping out of the pages and convicting me. I began doing what the Word says and allowed God to speak to me through this precious book. 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. All scriptures are inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to equip his people to do every good work. But the enemy wouldn't let me go that easily. So he enticed me to go to a Christian dating website to find another man to marry. I dated three other men and jumped into marriage again only after a year from my divorce. We got married in a church which was far better than my first marriage in a courthouse in the Philippines. I didn't realize that the enemy was stealing the words of God that I started learning. I made a wrong decision again and didn't consult God again. Proverbs 19, 21, you can make, my, make any, many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. The second marriage, as you can imagine, wasn't easy. I didn't allow myself to grieve over my losses and jumped into another pain and fear-filled decision. I was diagnosed with complex post-traumatic stress disorder shortly after my wedding. I wanted to run again and leave a problematic marriage. God convicted me and told me to stay in this marriage so he can heal and teach me. I, 1 Corinthians 7, 39. A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wish, wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. God gave me verses daily so I can meditate on it and write devotionals and poems. This began my healing journey. The Holy Spirit led me to leave the Catholic Church and be born again. This posed more conflicts with my Catholic husband, who is very religious. 1 Corinthians 7, 14. For the Christian wife brings holiness to her marriage, and the Christian husband brings holiness to his marriage. Otherwise, your children would not be holy, but now they are holy. God provided a free Bible college that I enrolled so I could study in-depth the Bible. It gave me wisdom to write my daily poem devotionals. He gave me a venue to minister to people worldwide through my video poem devotionals, and short teachings daily. It has been over four years that I have been blessed with this ministry. 
obedience and surrendering to God's call opened up a healing path for my marriage as well. God co-authored five years of poem devotional books and Bible study book on pain and trauma. Matthew 28, 19 to 20, therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It took over five decades before I learned what God's vision for me was because of many hindrances to prayers. God took them all out one by one during this season. God used my circumstances to heal me and allowed all the traumatic events in my life to happen so he can powerfully use it to touch other people's lives. He permitted me to pursue my lame plans so he could teach me patience, endurance, and understanding. He freed me from many strongholds and healed my, me from many physical, mental, and emotional illnesses. He didn't give me a jobs that didn't fit my gifts because he had big plans for me. He used my painting gifts, which became idols for me for many years, and turned it so I can worship and glorify him. He taught me a new way to pray, to use his words and personalize it to my life. He wants me to meditate on it day and night, and he taught me how to fast so I can have breakthroughs in my prayer life. He gave me a family of believers so I can belong. He made me hear his voice daily. He transformed me into the new person he wanted me to be. He showered me with his truth so I can be free from lies. Romans 12, 2, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. I end with my closing prayer. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to praise you for the miracles you have done in my life. May all the words that we heard today bring fruits in each one's life here. In Jesus' most powerful name, amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, we're a bit over our time, uh, but I quickly... Uh,